topic that I want to cover is about linear attention. So if you have n inputs, it means n tokens. So what is the complexity, either in terms of the computation or storage, of computing an attention matrix in one of the one of the layers that we have? So what is the size of the attention matrix? The attention matrix P is an n cross by uh, n, n cross uh, n matrix, right? So it has the probabilities of um, attention value between any pairs of tokens. So for large n, this can be very expensive, even to store. Just imagine you are processing like ten thousand or thirty thousand uh, words or tokens tokens. So just computing this matrix, it can be expensive. So how do we compute this matrix? By solving an inner product between the queries and the keys. So that computation is simple, is linear in the dimensionality of the keys and queries. But anyways, you need to repeat it, roughly speaking, in square times. So that, that part can be expensive. So the question is, how can we make this computation linear in N? So that's the, 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 the idea of linear attention, because in that case, we can scale up to larger input sizes. Okay, so in order to explain that idea, um, okay, so first, uh, this can be expensive. for large inputs. Okay, so the idea uh, was proposed in this paper by, by these people. I won't dare pronounce the last name, but you can find the paper on the course web page. So let's set up uh, uh, some notations. Uh, First, suppose we have n tokens, and each token has d values. Right? In the previous example, d was 5, 12, and n was 3 because we had three input tokens. So that's the matrix x. So you can think about the transformer as a mapping from n tokens, each represented with d values, to to how many, how many tokens? N tokens, thank you. Each represented with how many numbers? D numbers, right, in the, in the original design. So there is nothing specific about you know, having the same, the same things, but that is the design that uh, you know, we have. OK, and this is defined by L layers, T1 to TL, and in each layer we have the following function. When I apply the encoder on uh, at layer L, so what do I have? I have, I first apply the attention attention, self-attention layer to X. Then I have the residual connection. I add the output with the input. And I normalize it. And I push it through a feed-forward network. So I'll summarize that part. So this is my uh, feed-forward network plus layer norm. Noting that feed forward is applied to each row individually. Right? So we don't have the crosstalk in feed forward. That's it. That's the transformer function. So what is the what is the um, formula for the attention? 
So we first generate three matrices, the Curie matrix by multiplying X to matrix WQ. The, 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 the key matrix by multiplying X with WK and V matrix by multiplying X with WB. So here X is in D dimension in RD. These matrices will map a vector from D dimension, let's say to a vector from, um, from capital D dimension. So the output of the, uh, for the queries, keys and values, they can be different, in fact, they are different. So I use a bad notation here because in the previous case, my small D was 512, my capital D was 64. So capital D was smaller than this small, small D. Anyways, you get the idea. So using these three matrices, we form the attention matrix P. This matrix is an N by N matrix. And the formula that we had from the original uh, design was using the softmax on the inner product between queries and keys. That was the, the, the similarity values and be divided by the square root of the size of the keys that stabilizes the training uh, based on some empirical evidence and push it through the softmax. These are the probabilities that we get uh, in terms of the attention values between, between different layers, between different tokens. And then the attention layer is just simply multiplying this attention matrix with the value matrix. And we get the output of that self-attention layer. For the multi-head, we do it a bunch of times. We just concatenate the outputs, push it um, through uh, a projection, a linear projection layer. But that's basically right? just a, a mathematical summarization of, of what, we, what we covered <laughs> earlier in the lecture. Okay, but there is nothing really fundamental about using this particular formula here. So this is a good, good uh, maybe initial uh, try. So you wanna compute similarities between queries and values. You do the inner product, maybe you uh, normalize it and then push it through the softmax. But there is nothing really fundamental about using this particular formula. So you can use other similarity uh, measures between vectors. It doesn't have to be the inner product. So in fact, um, if I look at the ith row in my output, uh, here I'm just going to show with um, v prime of i, this is the ith row, this is the embedding generated for the ith token, I can rewrite the, the whole formula, this inner product by, um, by the following formula. I can look at the summation from one to n. I look at the similarity. It doesn't have to be the particular similarity function I'm using. It can be a general similarity between the query for that token and different keys. Remember, we get the, with these similarity numbers, and we multiplied it with the um, value vector for uh, corresponding to, to, to J, and we normalize it by looking at summation from one to n similarity between QI, query I, and key J. So if you look at this formula one and this formula two, they're equivalent. So you can show they are equivalent if the similarity function that we use between the query and key vectors is in the form of exponential function of the inner product between the two divided by the square root of uh, if I use this particular similarity function between these two vectors, Tori and Keith, I will get um, 
this exact formula that we had to compute the probabilities for my attention. But I don't have to use this particular formula for my, for my similarity computation. So in introduction to machine learning, what is the, what is the function uh, that we usually use to compute similarities between two vectors? Okay, obviously inner product or dot product is the, the, the to go option. It was already being used, but I wanna come up with something fancier than, than that. So what is that function? Okay, cosine similarity. It is also quite related to the inner product, right? It's like a little bit of a more general notion of computing similarity between, between two vectors. Kernels, right? So if, you know, I'm sure you have taken um, intro to machine learning, kernels, they generalize a measure or a notion of similarity between vectors, right? So, uh, instead of looking at just the inner product, we can look at the inner product between transformations of um, of uh, of the vectors. Maybe use. kernel as to compute similarity between Q and K. So kernel between, let's say, a vector Q and a vector K is defined as the inner product between a transformation of Q and a transformation of K. Let's call that transformation phi, uh, phi Q transpose times phi K. This is a transformation. It is fixed, right? So you pick it ahead of time. You can use a polynomial function, degree two, you get polynomial kernel. You can use, um, you can use Gaussian kernel, you can use other types of transformation. And the kernel trick um, is a trick that you don't actually need to compute these transformations explicitly. For some of these computations, you can uh, get a closed form value for the, to compute the kernel. Uh, so you get the benefit of having some nonlinear transformation, but without adding overhead in terms of your computation. But that's that's a kernel trick, um, not relevant. So if you, uh, in fact, the, this function, this is very similar to something called Gaussian kernel. In Gaussian kernel, it is like similar to the Gaussian density function. That's why it is called Gaussian kernel. So you can come up with a transformation such that the output of the trans the inner product uh, between the transform value of Q and K will give you exactly this formula. So on top of your head, can you come up with such a transformation in like two seconds? If you if you do it in like 10 seconds, you get A plus in the course, you don't need the project. No? What's that? R, we, that's the name of the kernel, right? So, okay, 10 seconds is done. Um, <laughs> I think you get an A plus that easily in the course. Um, okay, uh, that would be interesting. Uh, anyway, so there, there, is a, there, is a, there is a transformation, but that transformation has infinite dimensionality. So it is not finite in terms of the dimensionality of that transformation. So you can um, look it up very similar to the Gaussian kernel. So in the Gaussian kernel, you can come up with transformations of the vectors to give you exactly a formula similar to the Gaussian density, 
as your similarity measure, but the corresponding transformation has infinite dimensional. Therefore, not really practical, right? To use that, uh, that will be very expensive. But we can use other uh, kernels. Uh, so we, we can use this for practical purposes if you wanna explicitly compute the transform values because that will give you infinite dimensional vectors. But maybe we can use polynomial kernels with degree two or degree three or other, other transformations. So why should we do that? Or is it, is it a good idea to do that? So if I use a kernel to compute my similarity, the formula I'm going to get for the I prime, which is the output of my uh, encoder for token I can be written as the following. All right, so I have sum one to n. So similarity between qi and kj is going to be phi of qi vector transposed uh, phi of kj is the number multiplied by bj divided by the transformation of qi transposed kj, okay? But as you can see, now I decomposed, I broke this similarity to a product. Then this guy has nothing to do with my index j. So I can bring it outside of the summation. So before they were coupled, right? I and J, even though like, you know, I has nothing to do with J, but you know, it is somehow stuck in that similarity. So I couldn't bring it out of the summation because I could, I should also bring the other element out of the summation that I couldn't do it. But using the kernel, now I have the product. So I can factor this one out and bring it out of the summation. So what do I get? I get um, this formula transform value of qi multiplied by the summation. One to n. Transform version of qi multiplied by the summation. Okay. So let's see, um, in order to compute this, I need to compute this part, which means I need to compute the transformed versions of all the keys, multiply uh, with, the, with the value. So there's a trans uh, here, I'm sorry. Okay, but I'll do it once and I can store it, right? So because this, this part doesn't depend on I. It is the same for every token. The same thing here. So this part, I can, I'll just like, I'm adding up the transform values of my, my, uh, my keys. I, I'll apply the transformation one by one to key one, key two, to key n, sum it up once, and I'll store that vector somewhere in my machine. So this is done once. What is the complexity of this computation? It is order n, right? Because you are here just summing up n vectors or multiplying, um, multiplying, um, computing inner product of n vectors. So the complexity is order n. You do it once, you store it. Then for the next row when I compute, I can use the previous vectors that I already computed because that really doesn't depend on, on the row index. So the whole complexity of computing 
attention matrix and even storing the attention matrix goes down from n squared to order n. And I have linear dependence on the number of tokens using this trick. But the catch here is that you cannot use the original similarity similarity function, right? Because the corresponding phi for that has infinite dimensionality. So here I'm hiding the dimensionality of my features. So when I show something like this, you are going to be very happy. You're going to say, oh my God, I'm going from n squared to n. I should definitely use linear attention. But that's not always the case because there are some other uh, dependencies. So here, if you look at the dependency on the, the size of these feature transformations, these features usually they have bigger dimensionalities than the original dimensions of the vectors. So if your uh, original vector had, um, let's say, um, R elements, if you're using even a simple kernel, like a polynomial kernel of degree two, then your vectors will have lengths of R squared. So you are adding the dimensionality to, to these vectors. So there are some dependence on a uh, higher dependence on the dimensionality, uh, depending on like what kernel you are using. And you should uh, take that into account to see overall if this is a useful, uh, useful technique to reduce the computational complexity or not. So obviously, if you use a very complex kernel where your transformation is like huge and your n is not relatively too big, then this wouldn't be a good idea. But if your n is huge, if the number of tokens is huge, and you're using, let's say, a degree two uh, polynomial, so you are not really expanding your vectors that much, then the gain, the overall gain that you're going to get uh, can be substantial. So uh, that's, that's something that I want to highlight because maybe to say, okay, so this is a linear attention. You shouldn't take for granted that, okay, linear is of course better than quadratic. So I should always use linear attention. No, it really depends on the, 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 the kernel, uh, the, 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 the transformation that you use, as well as the number of uh, tokens that you are going to handle. 